56th Giro d'Italia, the Tour of Italy. The cycle race which this year has been extended for the first time to a semi-tour of Europe. 3,746 kilometers in 20 days. The Tour of Italy starts in Belgium. The procession sets off, stretching out for miles. Advertising caravans, press and television cars, police escort cars, race officials, radio intercommunication cars. And the field itself. 140 professional cyclists from many nations. Most of them are Italians, of course. But there are quite a number, too, of Belgians, Dutchmen, Spaniards, a couple of Frenchmen, some West Germans and Swiss, a Luxembourger, a Swede, and a Dane. Right behind the riders come the team cars, 28 of them. Two for each competing team, carrying coaches, mechanics, and masseurs. The ambulances and the pickup cars bring up the rear. The Tour of Italy has been held every year since 1909. It's the classical cycle race with a long and glorious roll call of legendary victories. Who can forget Fausto Coppi's row of victories? The winner in 1940, 47, 49, 52 and 53. In recent years too, the Giro has seen some great winners. Take Gimondi, Max, Gimondi again, Max again, the Swede, Gosta Pettersson, and Max again. And now the 73 edition is off on the first lap here on the road through a corner of West Germany. Max in the pink team leader jersey has the situation under control. The lonesome Dane, Ole Ritter, number 18, has broken out together with number 2, Bruguier, and number 86, Lascano. But Bruguier, one of Max's men, seems to be holding back, and the Spaniard doesn't seem too interested in putting his heart into the breakaway. Ritter pushes forward again, and his lead is concentrated and forceful. He's determined to pull the others on, but they slug on reluctantly, not keen on sacrificing themselves. Ritter shortens the lead to keep the brake from petering out. He's taking a hard, long lead, but he's in bad company. It's a beautiful waste of energy. Each day has a specific agenda. The rendezvous, the start, the prize spurt, the mountain Grand Prix, the refreshment zone. On the second lap from Cologne to Luxembourg, the only Luxembourger, Gilson, has taken off on his own. And he gets his reward, first across the border. But Merx is losing his patience. And this is the way he exerts his tactical authority. La course en tête. Control the race by taking the lead. But Gilson has still enough in reserve to glue onto the rear wheel of this express train charging through his own country. From Strasbourg to Geneva, 
the riders are transported by charter flight. On the far side of these mountains, Italy is waiting for its marathon cycle race, its favorite summer event. Nearly all the riders are still running, but soon the real hardships will begin. The Alps will be the first sample of the mountain terrain that is to come. So far, the race hasn't been defined. There are only slight time differences between the leading riders. Bex is still ahead, Vitossi is number two, and De Vlamink is running third. As yet, none of the favorites has been left behind. Merx has not succeeded in placing himself more than one minute ahead of Fuente, the Spanish king of the mountains. But in a few days, the picture will be in much clearer focus. The new tour of Italy will have assumed a more definite shape. Here's the field before the ascent to the pass. Drawn out in a long, long queue because of the wind. Way up front, Bruyere is slogging away with Gimondi's Cavalcanti on his tail. Obviously, Merckx has given orders to speed it up. Then it's up and on to the top of the pass. This is the first time a cycle race has been routed through the Mont Blanc tunnel, 11 kilometers long. All other traffic has been suspended for an hour or so. At last, Il Giro is on home ground and emerges on the sunny side of the Alps. The field free wheels down into La Bella Italia. passes with their eternal snow down into the town of Aosta. And the fertile Aosta Valley. A quiet time on the road. The rivals Merckx and Jamondi have a cosy chat together. Colleagues at leisure. Mech studies the lie of the land and the hardships of the days ahead. The geographic profile of the race. Now they're off on an eastern tack, this time with a side wind. With a side wind, fanning out affords the best cover. And the riders have to fight for their position in the fans. There is an understanding that each rider must take his turn on the windward side. From Bergamo, a trip up into the Trentine Hills, where thousands of Lombardians have gathered in honor of the event. Lombardy, the Trentines, and out to the Adriatic coast. Then back again into the country and up into the Apennines. The eighth lap from Lido by the Adriatic to the little mountain town of Carpegna in the Apennines is a lap which inspires awe in most of the riders. Jose Manuel Fuente studies the route. He feels the day holds possibilities because he's on home ground in the mountains. The steeper the better. They say he'll attack today. But Max has taken his precautions he sent two of his strongest henchmen, Hoosmans and Schoenmacher, up to the front. And with them as locomotives, he'll control the rate of speed from the foothills. This means forcing the pace, and his opponents are not at all pleased. Here it's Felice Gimondi and Gosta Patterson. Hoosmans keeps up his forceful slogging pace in the lead. Schoenmacher glues onto his rear wheel, ready to take over when Hoosmans is exhausted. The boss himself is running third, 
with Roger Switz and his tail in reserve. Behind this awesome Flemish phalanx, the field is panicking. Everyone's changing gear, desperately trying to get into the right rhythm and to maintain their place in the line. The field is drawn out like an accordion because of the pace of the leaders ahead. Cavalcanti looks over his shoulder. Where's Gimondi? There's a seat reserved for him right here. Cavalcanti is Gimondi's most unselfish assistant. Now it's really important to be up front among the leaders before the field breaks up. And that's bound to happen soon, the way Merckx is heaping coals on the fire now. Zilioli. Gimondi. And Pettison. They're all aware something is going to happen soon. For Fuente, the situation is critical. Up front, it's now Schoenmacher's turn and Hussmann's drops back. All the strongest have assembled up front. Now the real climbing starts and the field begins to crack. It's here that the first elimination takes place and the public are well aware of it. They know this is the spot for breakthroughs and breakdowns. The pace is grueling among the leaders. Riders get coupled off, one after the other. Fuente loses ground, fouled up by a gear change. And now he's chasing the Merckx group. Merckx himself has taken the lead. But Fuente is closing in on him. Here he overtakes the Olympic champion, Kuiper. And now the Italian veteran, Zilioli. Displaying his brilliant mountaineering style, Fuente continues to close up on Max and company. Francesca Moser is overtaken just as easily. Now he's drawing level with Hoosmans, Max's right-hand man, who has lost ground after his long lead earlier on. Fuente changes gear, passes Hoosmans and keeps up the pace. Now he can see the vanguard, 